ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ನಾನು ದೀಪಾ ಸಿರ್ಸಿಕರ್ ಇಂದಿನ ಜಿ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಚರ್ಚೆಗೆ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಸ್ವಾಗತ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಐ ದೀಪಾ ಸಿರ್ಸಿಕರ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಫಾರ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ಜಿ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ಕರುನಾಡಿನ ಅನಿವಾಸಿ ಹಿಂದೂಗಳ ಒಕ್ಕೂಟ ಮೊದಲ ಬಾರಿಗೆ ಜಿ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಪರೀಕ್ಷೆ ತಯಾರಿ ಮತ್ತು ಸಂಪರ್ಕದ ಸಲುವಾಗಿ ಈ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮವನ್ನು ಏರ್ಪಡಿಸಿದೆ ಈ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮದಿಂದ ಎಲ್ಲಾ ಜಿ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆಗಳಿಗೆ ಪರಿಹಾರ ಸಿಗಬಹುದೆಂದು ನಾವು ನಂಬುತ್ತೇವೆ ಕರುನಾಡಿನ ಅನಿವಾಸಿ ಹಿಂದೂಗಳ ಒಕ್ಕೂಟ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಈವೆಂಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಜಿ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಎಕ್ಸಾಮ್ ಪ್ರಿಪರೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟು ಕನೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬ್ರಿಂಗ್ ಕಹೋ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ಟುಗೆದರ್ ವಿ ಹೋಪ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ಸ್ ಟು ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ ಅ ಲಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕನ್ಫ್ಯೂಷನ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಪೇರೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟುಡೇ ಹಿಯರ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಹೂ ಆರ್ ಅಪಿಯರಿಂಗ್ ಫಾರ್ ಜಿ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ದಿಸ್ ಇಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಆಸ್ ದ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ನೈಸ್ ರಿಜಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ ಅಟೆಂಡೀಸ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಟುಡೇ ಸೊ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಯುವರ್ ಓವರ್ ವೆಲ್ಮಿಂಗ್ ರೆಸ್ಪಾನ್ಸ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ಈವೆಂಟ್ ಎಜೆಂಡಾ ವುಡ್ ಬಿ ವಿಲ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಕಹೋ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ದೆನ್ ಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ಸ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ದ ಚರ್ಚಾ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆನ್ಸರ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಜಿ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಫಿನಿಷ್ಡ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ವೋಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ಸ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ವಿ ಗೋ ಅಹೆಡ್ let's have a look at webinar etiquettes please keep your audio mute and video on during the meeting the audience will be placed on mute by the host that means you will not be able to mute or unmute yourself please share your questions in the chat window and click on the gray raise hand button this will signal to the host that you will be providing a public question or comment and you will be added to the list please note that this event would be recorded we suggest getting a pen and notebook to record useful informations we recommend parents to join along with the child to help if necessary we ensure that your video is please be ensured that your video will be turned on when you are asking questions so that the admin team can put you in the spotlight rules prohibiting the use of signs or posters remain in effect for video participation we also request you to re- rename your zoom login with parent name hyphen student name and your city we encourage you all to quickly glance through the slide to ensure the information and content shared today is for general information purpose only you should not rely upon any kind of decision making or legal purposes we will now play a short video to introduce you all to kaho This is the Kaho report for the Samanbaya Shibir. Kaho stands for Karunadina Anuwasi Hindu Gala Vakuta. It was inaugurated in November 2018, marking the 125th anniversary of Swami Vivekananda's speech in 1893 at Chicago. Kaho was actively involved during the COVID-19 pandemic. They worked hand in hand with other Sangha organizations, such as INSA, Seva UK and FISI. Children were part of an initiative called Kahol Spread Some Joy to show our appreciation to frontline key workers. This was done through creation of various pieces of art, such as drawings and poems. This remarkable effort was acknowledged and rewarded when Kahol won an award as Haro Heroes for supporting vulnerable people during COVID-19. Kaho organized Parliament Week, in which over 100 families participated. This was joined by the Dartford MP, Mr. Gareth Johnson, along with councillors Sri Avtar Sandhu and Chris Shippen. This is the first of its kind where awareness was raised to the Kannada community about the functioning of Parliament in the UK. The Kaho families played a virtual Parliament debate activity and also had fun participating in online elections. In regards to the 2021 census, the once in a decade activity, Kaho was very lucky to join hands with Insight and other organizations to bring awareness to the Kannada community in the UK through the Census 21 awareness program. Kaho organized Yuva Jagriti Shibir in 2021 with a the theme, the glory of the Vijayanagara empire and the awareness of Hindu culture. 
Shri Krishna Devaraya, 19th lineage of the Vijayanagara kingdom, graced the occasion for Bodhik. Adhikari Manyanya Shri Dhirajji enlightened us with Bodhik, and Dr. Vidula Tai Ambedkarji guided us on Charcha. The event was attended by around 140 Kaho Parivar members. Kaho organized a webinar on the women's social welfare hijab issue. Is it political or religious? An interaction with advocate Subuhi Khan, a Supreme Court lawyer, and Esther Danraj. Kaho organized Jnana Jyoti Shibira in May 2022. This year's theme was based on the four pillars of Sri Jagat Jyoti Basveshwara's thoughts, namely democracy proponent, social activist, literature through Vachnas, and spirituality. Karyakartas together prepared Anubhava Mandapa with Shivalinga and Mahadwara of Kudala Sangama. Anubhava Mandapa was the first foundation laid for democracy by Baswana. Part of the Shibir was also raised funds for Chalukya style, 700 year old Siddha Rameshwara temple restoration. The Shibir was well attended by over 220 Karyakartas across the UK. As part of Yoga Day, Kaho organized yoga across the UK at various places. Over 600 Kaho members participated. A, a five day yoga workshop was also organized online. This yoga workshop was designed to create awareness on living healthier, happier, and leading stress-free lives. Also, Kaho Karyakarta led the yoga event organized by the Deputy High Commission of India in Birmingham. In summary, Kaho has been growing from strength to strength since its inception, integrating into and contributing to the wider UK Samaj. By uniting the Kannada Hindu Parivars across the UK, upholding our Sanskriti and keeping us firmly rooted to our motherland. I would now like to welcome and introduce our guest speakers. Today, today we have with us Mrs. Suprita Rao. Mrs. Suprita Rao has achieved master's in Software Engineering from Bits Bilani, her postgraduate certificate in Education in Computing from the Institute of Education, University College of London. She is currently the Head of Computing at Hushal Grammar School and tutors students at GCSE and A-level in Computer Science. Welcome to our event, Mrs. Rao. Our next guest Thank is... You. Yeah, welcome. Uh, our next guest today is uh, Dr. Sunil Anandatirtha. He is a mathematics tutor from Coventry. He has a PhD in material and aerospace engineering and is actively involved in teaching maths at various school and university levels since a decade and a half. Welcome to the event, Dr. Anandatirtha. Our next guest for today is Mrs. Sadia Sai. She has done BA honors in English from Royal Holloway University of London. She is a teacher of English and also a literacy coordinator. Welcome to the event, Mrs. Sai. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Our last guest for today is Mr. Ali Abder a teacher of chemistry, PGCE in secondary education with QT, QTS. He has done his MSc in cancer biology, BSc honors in biomedical science. He is an examiner for AQA and OCR exam boards and also tutor for over 10 plus years. Welcome to the event, Mr. Apter. Pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Hello, welcome. Uh, we are very honored to have such experienced teachers with us today. And I now hand over it to Mrs. Suprita Rao to give the overview of GCSE. Thank you very much, Deepaji, and uh, welcome to everybody to this Charcha session today. Before we start, I would like to just give a very brief introduction to what GCSE is for those who are um, unaware of this or are new to the system or have moved from uh, India newly and want to know what GCSE is all about. 
So what are GCSEs? Uh, GCSE stands for a General Certificate of Secondary Education. Um, it is uh, the qualification in, that we use in the UK uh, at the age of 15 and 16. It's an academic qualification and it's taken over two years, which is year 10 and year 11. Um, the, G the GCSEs in the UK is a linear qualification. I'll tell you more about what a linear qualification is in just a little bit. But they're intended to give a very broad foundation of knowledge uh, that will prepare for further study, such as A-levels, B-techs, apprenticeships, and IB diplomas. Um, it is actually compulsory uh, to take GCSEs in English, Maths, and Science, which we term as the core subjects. And alongside this, we do uh, allow students to take up uh, exams for optional subjects, which we will learn about in just a little bit. So next, we understand what, uh, what do you mean by exam boards? So in, in the UK, we, we operate um, the GCSE with AQA, CC, uh, CCEA, OCR, Edexcel, et cetera. These are different examination boards. So for those who few who have studied in India, you will be aware that we uh, we either do SSLC in Karnataka or regional boards if you're from other states, and uh, we call it just the 10th standard. But when we come into the UK, we do it over two years, and at the end of year 11 is when we sit this GCSE exam. Now the exams uh, are are basically accredited, or they are uh, uh, they are given to you by one of these boards that are mentioned on the screen to you. Now, the most famous ones are AQA, OCR, and Edexcel. So Pearson operates under Edexcel banner. And in Wales, it's a little bit different uh, with the Wales Joint Education Committee um, uh, using the brand as Educas. So the typical age of a child when they take up GCSEs in the UK is between 15 and 16 years. And it uh, usually is conducted in the month of May. So a child is typically about 15 and a half years or by the time they take their GCSEs. So when they uh, finish their GCSEs and move on to the next level, which is also called as the A level, uh, we call that as post 16, because anything after 16 is when they uh, do the rest of their qualifications. Next slide, please. Okay, so coming on to the core subjects and the option subjects. So all students are expected to have a qualification in math, English, and science. Um, maths and English language is a compulsory subject, no doubt. With science, students have an option of taking either a combined science, which is two of three sciences, or all three sciences, which is also called as triple science. Alongside these core subjects, they do qualifications in a range of option subjects. So when I say modern foreign languages, it could be in Spanish, German, French, Tamil, Punjabi, Bengali, it could be a range of subjects, humanities like geography and history, physical education, art and design, so on and so forth. I mean, obviously I cannot give you the whole list, but there are, I think about 40 different subjects that are offered uh, across these boards. So one thing that uh, we need to understand is for each of these subjects, uh, you need to follow what we call as a specification, and the specification is associated with the board. So not necessary, just like how we have it in India, that everybody follows a CBSE board, and it is a CBSE board for all the subjects. It's not like that. It's a little bit different out here. Every subject follow their own specification, and schools have the opportunity to choose which board they want to follow for which subject, and that's flexible as well. Um, so that's something that uh, a lot of y'all do get confused about, so I just thought I'd mention that. So once we uh, understand what these subjects are, we also do need to understand how the grading is done on these subjects. So for those of you who've had siblings um, a few years ago, uh, you would have seen the grading system starting with an A star, A, so an A star to C kind of a grading, or A star to G kind of a grading. So in now we do follow what we call as the GCSE nine to one grading, uh, nine being the highest grade and one being the lowest grade. Now uh, four is a minimum grade that is required, uh, which is also called as the standard pass to achieve a particular qualification in a subject at the end of year 11. Um, Manuji, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. 
So grade four and above, it's uh, it considered as a credible achievement for any young person. It should be valued as something that's absolutely necessary for further study and employment or apprenticeships uh, in some cases. And that is the minimum stage that uh, minimum level that we do expect in uh, the core subjects as well. So if a person uh, has not been able to reach that minimum level of grade four in English and maths, they are expected to do or continue their study post 16 as well uh, to complete a part of the uh, part of the qualification. There is no concept of um, repetition of a particular year, just like how it happens back in India. So people do not fail a particular year. Uh, they just retake it and prepare better in the next year and they carry on with the other subjects. So a little bit more about um, uh, further education or after GCSE, post GCSE, so GCSE and beyond in other words. So all uh, employers, universities, colleges, et cetera, do expect GCSE, which is your basic foundation. But beyond this comes post 16, and you have a variety of options that you can uh, take up at post 16. The first one being A-level, which is the most uh, commonly heard one. A-level stands for advanced level. It's a more academic qualification in terms of they do have um, uh, work to be done, uh, exams to be written, and some could have a coursework element as well. BTEC is a business and technology education council. And these are qualifications at level two, level three, uh, level three is equivalent to A-levels. It's just that it has more coursework elements in it rather than an exam. So if, if a student is not very comfortable taking up um, an exam, uh, they might want to choose to take up a BTEC. Or if they think they're, they're very good at something vocational or they want to go the vocational route, BTEC would be uh, your way to go. IB diplomas are uh, international baccalaureate diplomas, which consist of usually about six subjects, which we will find out a little bit more uh, in our Chacha sessions as well. Apprenticeships. Uh, apprenticeships are basically uh, you, you learn whilst you work. Uh, there are level two, level three apprenticeships, and you can also get, a lot, get to doing your uh, degree apprenticeships, which is level four, five, et cetera. So there are multiple routes beyond GCSE, but um, the least I can say is you need your qualifications at the GCSE level, especially in maths and English, which are your course subjects to go beyond. Um, with this brief introduction, I think I would like to actually um, open up to uh, our charcha session. And uh, I would actually like to ask my very first question to Mr. Abda. Okay, so uh, Mr. Abda, I'm sure many of us out here, me included as a parent, uh, one of the questions in my mind is um, with the GCSE is around the corner, how can you manage students and parents stress alike? What's the best way through that? Okay, so I did actually prepare a few slides, but I didn't get a chance, that's fine. I'm just gonna go through it instead. So I think key thing coming up to the exams is so fast approaching now around the corner. Um, I think it's important for I think to have a plan between the parents and students is really important. I think there needs to be some sort of organization and a system in place in order for the student to follow. Um, and I think knowing when the first exams are and having sort of a, a system in place really helps the students to, um, you know, A, have a plan in place to support them with their studies and B, for the parents to also keep track of how they're getting on, 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 their, on their own as well. And I think key thing is, you know, Communication to school is important to understand like what the exam boards are, so you know what the specifications you're following. Um, and I think just making sure that you are ticking off as you go along everything that you've covered to have like a good system in that sense to follow up with what's been done and what needs to be covered. And I think um, and in terms of techniques, I think everyone's a different learner. So one of the things that I always say to students is when you go to a, a lesson, the lecture or the session in class, you take less than 10% information. And then most of it comes from further reading, you know, watching videos, listening to a, a, a further talk or demonstration. Uh, and you learn the best way by practice by doing, I say. So it's important to practice lots of exam practice, lots of questions. Uh, and the best way to be able to know if you know the content really well is, a, is to teach it to others. And so I always encourage students to, you know, sit down with a group of friends and, you know, go through topics with each other. Uh, and I think from, from the parents' perspective, I think it's going to be very important to, 
be mindful of the fact that you know students attending the school having good attendance punctuality meeting deadlines and then contributing to the wider you know community within the school it makes them a more all-rounded individual uh, but in terms of exams i think it's crucial when it, to um you know on, on when you're coming up to it it's important to be you know in terms of um Getting, getting a good right amount of sleep, I think, is important. For example, um, that makes it, it gives them because they need to be productive. The time frame we have from now until then, they can overdo it sometimes or not do enough. And I think both extremes are bad. But the balance is really, really important. So you know, eating sensibly, taking exercise, going, you know, having a balance is really, really key. I think going with with regards to success. But from the parents' perspective, I think we can we can support them with that. So giving you know, ensuring they have a good work ethic making sure they're not you know overusing their phones or the internet or you know doing things that they shouldn't be doing um and like i said following that timetable ensuring they're meeting their deadlines for each subject in terms of the topics they need to cover by a certain point it's really i would say key to to the success uh, and speaking to the subject teachers from the students and parents perspective is making sure that you know they are covering everything like i said is irrelevant uh, and so those are a few things that i think is going to be very important in order to be successful in the exams but key key thing right now, I would say, because it's coming so close to it, it's going to be lots of practice, practice, practice. And it's going to be exam questions, past paper questions, and actually going through the mark schemes to make sure that you know you're understanding how to write the answers, to use the right key terminologies, right um keywords and so forth. But yeah, just that I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It definitely does make. I mean, it's a it's a good in-depth. Uh, kind of an understanding of how to approach the exams. And I completely do agree with the fact that, you know, students need to get a lot of rest. Um, they need to be able to unwind so that they can be more productive and mm -hmm. uh, they should cooperate. I mean, parents and children together should be able to cooperate to have a very healthy lifestyle to be able to cope with that kind of exam stress. Thank you, Mr. Abda. Um, so our next question that we have out here, I think it's uh, Ms. Sai, uh, I think if you would like to take this up or pick this up. At what stage are students uh, expected to choose their GCSE options in secondary? And how would you think you can advise them to make um, appropriate choices? Okay, so my understanding is that they choose in year nine, early on in the beginning of year nine, most schools will have a subject evening or, evening or a parents evening. I think they call it options evening. So they will invite parents in to speak uh, with them about what the whole procedure is. And they usually also distribute some information such as a booklet, or it may well be a parent mail, you know, letter home, explaining the different choices that the students have to make. Um, and sorry, what was the second half of your question? And what's the best well, way that they, they choose? choose these subjects? Yeah. Now that's, that's, that's quite a subjective question, actually. Um, in the past, both for myself and you know, students that I've taught as well, usually it, it depends on the type of school you go to. It, it also depends on you know, what the parents' uh, you know, ambitions or goals in the future and the student themselves. So in the past, a lot of times, if you go to you know an ordinary comprehensive school they will give you the kind of generic advice you know go with what you're good at what you enjoy to an extent that's great and very helpful and i would say to parents to be realistic um for students for example that may go to a more sort of slightly higher kind of institution such as a grammar school there's a or a private school there does tend to be a lot more pressure perhaps from parents or the students themselves to get into certain fields. Uh, so for example, medicine or you know, any of the kind of more professional careers. So they may have different aspirations for their child, in which case, sometimes I've seen a mismatch occur where a child, for example, has a real passion or love for the humanities. Um, and you know, perhaps they are not, you know, this is they've tried everything, and even then perhaps they are not able to achieve um, to this the very high standards, sometimes unrealistic standards, to be honest, that parents and they themselves may have. And their teachers in those subjects, so for example, technology, science, may actually even be gently hinting that perhaps they don't want to take this up. You know, they could do it for GCSE, but maybe not put so much pressure on themselves um, where they excel in other subjects, you know. Um, but sometimes the pressure is just so much that they find themselves a little bit stuck 
and having to take these paths. So again, I would say, you know, we spoke about stress earlier for students during GCSE. I would say, I think parents need to be a little bit understanding and realistic. We all want what's best for our children. Of course we do, but we have to understand that they have, you know, there's a, a wider well-being that's very important, you know. Um, so I'd say be realistic, be supportive, be helpful, and do talk to your child. Children also talk, please students, do talk to your parents about what you may wish to do and try to reach a, a realistic compromise, I think, because I see students extremely stressed in year nine. Um, you know, I have a year 10 form at the moment. Some of them are really stressed about what options to take. And they just need a gentle conversation sometimes to get back on track, really. Um, just be realistic, I think. Uh, be ambitious, be aspirational, but be yeah. holistic about it. That's what I would say. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Sai. I, I totally agree. I mean, you need to follow what your heart says at times. You need to follow the part that you think you're very good at as well. I think parents also need to be able to support you uh, in, in that kind of a decision. And this is especially for the students, of course. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, this is, I think, one of um, one of my personal favorite questions as well. And I think uh, Dr. Sunil, uh, Mr. Alan Tisda, he can pick this up. Um, maths is obviously one of the fundamental questions, uh, fundamental subjects uh, that students need to learn. However, it's not very easy for many students. Students do struggle. Um, what in your experience can students do about this? How, how do you think it, they can make it easy uh, and master the skills? Well, thanks a lot uh, for this question. It's a wonderful question. It's very, very relevant for all the, for all the students and the parents as well. And uh, before I start off, you know, like I would really like to thank all the organizers so that uh, in bringing us all together on the same platform, it's going to benefit the parents and the students a lot. And I also thank previous speakers and uh, Dr. Ali Abdur and Dr. Sahi for your valuable comments. And I think they were very, very potent and then extremely valuable for everybody. I would like to, uh, you know, like uh, build upon some of the points that you have already mentioned and then provide uh, sort of a scaffolding approach where you are. Uh, the number one thing that uh, students and the parents need to do at this moment, for example, is basically when you have exams coming up fast soon, so like that, you need to strategize. Without a strategy, uh, it's not going to be fine. You need to strategize where is your point A and where is your point Z. So you need to find out which are the intermediate points you're going to be visiting and you're going to be spending time at, and then you're going to be mastering or you're going to be revisiting or you really relearn them. The number one thing that you have to do in, for example, I'm going to do it in terms of two sets of answers. One is for the people who are going to face an exam very soon. And one is the, for, the, uh, for the set of students who are going to prepare a bit later on in their lives, probably one year down the lane. Right. For example, the, the first set, uh, you really need to um, find out what are your strong points. Right. Once you find out your strong points in mathematics, First, get all the fundamentals perfect. Without the fundamentals, it, it's not an easy task to prepare for mathematics. Fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. So it's a triple F solution. Number one is fundamentals, and then is application of these fundamentals to the problems or these concepts that you're already very, very well familiar of. Make 100% preparations in these concepts. And is, for example, if you are strong in algebra, make sure that you are very, 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 very good in algebra. And then once you're so confident, use that confidence so that sort of, sort of like scaffold yourself higher and higher in the other concepts, right? You don't start off in all the concepts at once. You start off in one concept, you build your confidence and use that confidence for other topics as well so that you can use this kind of a strategy in a very short limited amount of time that you may be having. And not just that, you should also be focusing on topic-wise questions that you are already having in previous exam papers and also the mock papers. For example, if I take up some question papers from 2015, for example, I look up what are the questions that I am having from algebra, where which are my strength points. So when I am very confident that I can solve all these questions from algebra, from these question papers, from 2010 on to 2022, there is no better kind of a confidence sort of a preparation that I could do rather than this. Now you are very well prepared for algebra. Now that 50%, 20% of your topics is done, now move on to the next topic. So that's way, that's how you should start preparing for mathematics examinations when your exams are very, very around, you know, very short are approaching, right? And for the second sort of batch, uh, what I would say is number one is once again, fundamentals, 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 get your fundamentals right. 
And the second one is understanding of the concepts and then the application of the fundamentals in solving these problems using the concepts that you have learned. And then masters problem solving, right? Problem solving is absolute. The more the problem solving you do, the better you get at solving the problems by using various different types of techniques. Because there is not just one technique where you can use to solve a problem. There are four or five different types of techniques. There's a technique technique that you need to follow for calculator exam or a different type of a calculator technique that you can follow for a non-calculator exam. So you have to be well-versed in these. When do you get to well-versed in all of these? When you are rigorous in your approach, you got to be very, very rigorous in the way you practice problems. If you are done with solving 10 problems and you are so confident that you are, you can all solve all the problem in the topic, Remind yourself for, for something which is good, there will always something which will be better. So for a complex problem that you know how to solve, there will be a slightly more complex that you are going to be facing. So you should be always prepared for the higher level. So the more you pre preparations you put in from your efforts and time, the better you get. So, but with all these things trying to scare away the parents and the, uh, and the students, one good thing is that you got time on your uh, uh, on your side and strategy on your side. And as other previous you know um, uh, speakers mentioned about the strategy with respect to the parent and the child conversation, making this as stress free as possible is absolutely key. The more stress you get, the less efficient you become. So I would like to you know end my kind of uh, answer to your question. But the most important thing is strategy, efforts, preparation, and confidence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have some questions on the chat right now, and I would like to kind of pick up some of them. Um, uh, I have a question here from uh, Mr. Arun Patel. He asks, uh, can students use uh, an electronic uh, device or a com like a computer to answer or has it to be handwritten only? I think uh, exam papers, as of now, traditionally, they're all handwritten. However, if a child is in need of an electronic device uh, because they have been uh, recognized as having a special need, uh, like for example, the handwriting might be illegible, um, or maybe you know they need um, uh, some other kind of a scribe kind of a thing for being able to uh, cope with the exams. Uh, they, it will be recognized and picked up by uh, teachers and a special team of uh, teachers in school. And once that is approved is when a student gets the chance to use an electronic device, like a computer to be able to, or a scribe to be able to give their exams. Otherwise, it's traditionally going to be handwritten only at the end of year. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Um, and I have another question out here. Uh, it says, is school coaching enough? Or do we need to also go for private tuitions? Uh, Mr. Abda, do you, would, would you like to pick this up? Do you think it's enough to be with school coaching or do you think students would require more? Yeah, sure. Uh, I get this question asked by a lot of parents. Um, sometimes they come in parents evening <clears throat> and they'll say to me, do you think my, my, my son or daughter will require um, you know, additional uh, tuition, for example? And all the tutors out, they would love to hear that they did additional tu tuition. However, I think you have to be be basic. You have to base on your uh, individual uh, child's need. And the best thing to do would be to get them to do a past paper, for example, get them to market themselves or you market, for example, using the mark scheme and see what percentages of marks they're getting. And if they can actually look at the mark scheme and see where they've gone wrong and they can actually rectify that mistake themselves or by looking at their books and you, you open book, let's say, and checking it for themselves and they can do that, that's great. However, you'll find that there are some subjects, especially the sciences, they... Um, Sometimes by looking at the mask scheme, it's not quite clear. So it makes it difficult to actually know how to answer that question. And I, I assume the same will be with maths as well, where some methods will be different. And so sometimes it's quite difficult to understand how they got to the final answer. Uh, and in that sense, it does come with some help with the guidance from an expert who they'll be able to, you know, straight away tell you, well, this is where you're going wrong. And this is how you should have written the answer. And this is another way you could have done it, for instance. And it gives them a wider uh, reach in terms of answering that particular question so to kind of in short to answer that question um, in some cases I would recommend to have a tutor especially towards the end of I would say when they come into their GCSE exams like this year if you're in year 11 it really helps with coming in you know, exam techniques 
uh, coming with, uh, you know, coming to terms with how to approach six marker questions, for example, it really helps with, you know, this if the, if the tutor is able to give them strategies to model their answers, uh, and it gives them that additional bit of support, I would say, to stand out from the rest of the crowd. And so, yes, definitely with help, I would say, uh, with, uh, but in year seven, eight, and nine, I don't think it's necessary to have a tutor because a lot of the support from school is available, uh, and it's not necessary to, to to take any additional support. However, some people do choose to. To do that because it keeps their child in check and it allows them to you know do extra work outside of school and it kind of means that they're well prepared for the actual GCSEs in in, in plenty of time in hand and so uh, my personal recommendation is you don't need it for seven eight and nine but maybe in year ten and eleven depending on the ch uh, ch child's need. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a question here from uh, Shubha Rao. Uh, she's asking: Is it possible for a school to follow, say, AQA for one subject and OCR for other? Uh, yes, Shubhavra, you it is definitely possible. Um, all schools have, they follow different specifications. When I say specification, I'm talking about boards. So they could have um, an edXL for maths. They could be having OCR for science, um, AQA for computer science, et cetera, et cetera. So you could be having different specifications, different boards being followed for different subjects. And it differs from school to school. So it's a totally um, a decision of the school uh, to choose whichever board they're going to. So when your child gets into the GCSEs, uh, it's best to ask their teachers what board they're gonna follow for the subject, uh, pull out the specification, it's available online, um, and then go through the specification to know what content they need to know or they should be studying. I hope that answers your question. Um, so I have another question. Uh, are the marks taken in year seven, eight, and nine considered for any part of the GCSE grading? Uh, Ms. Sai, would you like to pick this up, please? Sure. Um, as far as I'm aware, no. So how your child does in year seven, eight, and nine, for example, in my subject English, um, that doesn't necessarily affect uh, their GCSE score, but depending on your school, it may affect um, what group they are put into. Uh, so setting, for example, some schools have different classes. So for English in within one year group, they may have five different um, five different sets. So set one being the top set, for example, where students need a lot of challenge and stretch. And for example, set five being perhaps where they need a slightly slower pace. Um, and this happens in most schools actually in the UK. Having said that, um, it, it's no longer the case now. It used to be in the past in the UK that which set you were in determined what, uh, to what extent you could achieve your GCSE grade. So for example, before it used to be, you could be in set five and the highest perhaps you would be able to achieve is a grade four at GCSE. That is no longer the case as of, I believe 2017, uh, certainly for English anyway. So the good news is whatever group your child is put into from, for example, year eight onwards, it shouldn't affect what GCSE score they can achieve. They can still get a nine regardless of what group they're put in. It will just be the pace of their learning will change slightly so that they're able to achieve. I hope that answers the question. Yes, I do think it answers the question. And also I would like to add there that uh, however, the ch child performs in seven, eight, and nine. At the end of year nine, most schools they do test uh, their students to determine what set they will be in, should they need it, um, and they also use that uh, as internal information to predict grades that they could achieve uh, at the end of year eleven. However, that's all subject to change based on how students perform over the years. So obviously, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question. How many optional subjects need to be opted? Um, so I think more than one person has asked this. Uh, Dr. Sunil, do you want to pick this up, please? Well, I think more than one can be uh, opted up, depending upon uh, the capability of the parent and also the availability of the uh, faculties inside the school. And I think the best way to go forward is to contact your school and make sure that you really are interested in taking up an optional and then definitely discussion with your parents and also your friends. How would, uh, how are things happening? How have your seniors been doing, you know, before you take up an optional? And also you need to be having a clear perspective of probably maybe your career path in the future as well. But the best way is to get in touch with your faculties in the school and then take it forward from there. Thank you. 
Um, can I just add to that? Um, sure. So when it comes to the um, options as well, um, some schools will offer three or four, uh, uh, particularly um, in some schools, they'll expect you to also take a language, uh, for example. So it really is subjective to the school. Um, so in, in regards to picking the subjects, I think having it all round the subjects is very well favoured by Russell Group Universities. So if you take a language, for example, and you take um, a, a humanities subject, and then you take um, something like arts, then it's seen as an all round the subjects. So they see, they deem that very well. Uh, and so again, in some places, it's not compulsory to do a language, but you'll find that, for example, at Herschel, where we, where we are based, they, it's compulsory for them now to take a language for GCSEs, for instance, and it's for it's for that post-16, post-18 options, it gives them better opportunities because some universities will require a wider range of um, subjects to be studied um, in some cases, not always, but in some cases, it's favoured by the Russell groups generally, um, but again, by schools, it's, it's, it's very subjective, so it's best to check with the school options they have available. Absolutely, thank you, which actually answers uh, one of the questions that Pradeep has asked out here, asking, are GCSE scores considered for university ad admissions in addition to A-level scores? Uh, I think definitely they are considered. Uh, the universities at university, they do expect you to have a minimum of a four, definitely in four, that means it's a, a standard pass across the subjects. However, uh, each university has a different expectation um, regarding with regards to subjects that you've uh, qualified in in your A-levels, uh, as well as uh, the, um, uh, the GCSE grades. So they could be asking you for a seven, a minimum of a, a grade seven in maths maybe, or a minimum of a grade eight or so, so in English, based on, of course, the type of uh, course that you want to do. So it's, it's all counted in and it's uh, there's there's nothing like, you know, GCSE is just for the A-levels, but they, it is kind of, um, a, a benchmark that you set for yourself uh, for A-levels and beyond. Um, so I have another question asked from Sudha asking, can you pour in some inputs on triple science and combined science and how to opt for triple science if the student is interested? I think, uh, Mr. Abda, you can take this up. Sure. So triple. Uh, so most schools in the UK tend to offer combined science, and then the top sets in the school tend to be opted in for a triple science. So just to kind of clarify the difference, so triple science, you get three separate science grades. So you get one for biology, one for chemistry, one for physics. In regards to combined science, it's of equal difficulty. It's just there are a few topics taken out. So it just means that for the student, less stress and more time to prepare for their exams. And so they, they, they get two GCSE grades instead of three in that sense. They still do biology, chemistry and physics separately, but they just get average to two grades for their science. Um, in terms of opting in for whether it's triple science or not, most schools have a system in place in regards to which students to go on to do triple science. So for instance, in our school, all students do triple science. Being a grammar school, they're very academic. So they're all kind of capable of doing all, all sciences at the highest level. Um, but in majority of cases, so 90% of schools, only the top set in that school will be opt will be um uh you know will be able to do the triple science option. So in if you do want your child, for example, to take up uh triple science you'd have to first of all ensure they're achieving high grades during their year nine and year 10 because that's when it will determine when they get um, submitted for the exam board whether it's triple science or combined science and also in combined science you can get higher foundation paper as well so the higher paper allows us to get, get a grade of up to grade nine uh, and in in the foundation side you can get a highest grade of grade five so again uh, just to kind of clarify in all in in a nutshell uh, triple science is only offered to the top students normally and then the rest of the students normally do combined science, and a very few people, a few students will do the combined foundation as well. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of questions are regarding uh, mock exams. So, how important are mock exams, and where can we find mock paper links? Um, Dr. Sunil, would you like to pick this up? Yeah, thank you. Uh, mock exams are very, very important in that uh, it helps you understand where you stand. Uh, in terms of your preparations. Um, if uh, you really need to take some mock exams to get a reality check in number one, uh, and number two is it helps you prepare or understand what are your weak points or strong points, and you can build upon them. And there are numerous places where you can take up uh, mock exams. They are available uh, 
online as well. And then you can also take up the tutoring institutes. Many tutoring institutes are available. And also people, uh, probably also some of them, uh, some of your schools might be giving uh, mock examples and mock, mock exams as well. So keep your eyes open. And there are a lot of places which gives, um, you know, such opportunities to improve your uh, preparations. But overall, what I would say is um, use these as a sort of uh, a reality check and then um, building up on what you have already prepared so far and make sure that you have already covered your ground before you start taking up mock exams. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, before we have, we listen to one of our uh, ex students, so uh, one of our year 12 students who would like to share their experiences with us. I would uh, like to just pick up one uh, other question before that. Uh, how does it impact your GCSE results if the pupil scores low in languages? So is, uh, is there any way in which we can improve our language grades and is it very important? Ms. Sai, would you like to take that up, please? Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm assuming they mean modern foreign languages? Yes. Or English? Yeah. I think both. I think both. Yeah, possibly both. Yeah. So what I usually say, I, and I do have some experience in this actually because I did do French uh, GCSE and A-level. And at GCSE, I also took Urdu um, and at A-level, I took it as an optional extra. Uh, my advice for students, whether it's for English language, French, you know, Spanish, German, you need to immerse yourself in the language. So at the start of year 10, you will already know you will have chosen whichever language you are going to take up if you've chosen a language, you know, depending on your school offering that option. And it's really important that you understand if it's not a language that you are already speaking at home, you know, with your parents, then you need to really immerse yourself in it. So what do I mean by that? I mean, what you are reading, what you're listening to, even the news you are watching, you know, um, even the entertainment, social media things that you're using, they, you need to try and go more towards the language that you're studying, really. Um, if you can, even, you know, visit, for example, if it was French, if you can go for a short visit, if you have relatives there, or, you know, if there's any way you can go and visit or speak to native speakers, even within the UK, take any extracurricular clubs. So your school may offer, you know, lunchtime or after school French club, for example, um, do it and take every opportunity really that you can to speak that language as much as possible and to listen to that language. That would be my advice really. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, we have Adi Kamath, uh, a year 12 student who would like to share his experiences of his GCSE years and his, um, his exam experience uh, overall. So Adi, if you're around, I welcome. Would you like to share what you think and what you thought and your experiences, please? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um... So um, I took my GCSEs last year, and especially for my year group, it was a very difficult year due to COVID. We had a lot of inconsistent teaching, uh, for example, and uh, also we had a lot of uncertainty whether exams were going to take place or not. Uh, as a result, uh, we had to find ways of getting around those issues. Uh, so I think my parents really supported me quite a lot. Uh, during that period, uh, I asked them for resources. They would uh, get me the resources they could so I could uh, revise effectively. And uh, speaking of that, there are specific methods of revision that people like uh, as well. So um, in terms of revision, uh, it, it, different types of revision suit uh, different people. So, for example, I don't really like flashcards. That's not really my sort of thing, but others like flashcards. My main thing was uh, blurting out information, past papers and mind maps, because with mind maps and uh, blurting out information, you could build quite good summaries of uh, topics and you can compile information very easily. And past papers, past papers will work for like anyone pretty much because Past papers are the only way you can perhaps practice exam technique and also revise knowledge at the same time. It's a very efficient way of doing uh, your own work. 
And speaking of uh, efficiency, it is very important to be very disciplined across. And throughout, uh, throughout year 11, I was very uh, disciplined. I knew when I needed to study. I knew when I needed to you know, press the brakes for a bit as well. And that's another important thing too. Uh, during my exam period, I would often, I had, um, in fact, many people have done this, so I've spoken to, uh, I'm also a culprit of this. We sort of um, uh, underestimate how much time we have or, or overestimate how much time we have. So like studying, it only took up about 30% of my time as a whole, but, uh, and you, had, you have so much time in between. It, you don't need to constantly study 24 7 it's important that you also indulge in some of your hobbies and also switch off for a little bit as well so that you can uh, uh, revise effectively and efficiently whilst also not being stressed too much uh, uh, it's also also keep doing your hobbies keep doing your hobbies keep uh, doing your activities do do everything you can because at the end of your GCSEs, when you receive your results, you don't want to look back and go like, I could have had a lot more. I could have been much happier during this period, you know, because firstly, your GCSEs, uh, uh, you, you may get all nines, but you could have achieved the, all those nines, even if you had a little bit of fun in between, you know, I, I, I had that. Uh, feeling when I got my GCSEs and it would hurt to see if anyone else uh, had that in the future. I'd like to end by saying that if you're currently in year 11 and you, you have exams in a few weeks time, it's okay to feel nervous right now. Trust me, everyone feels nervous. It's a natural feeling. Uh, but I would also like to say that the nerves, they'll only be there just before the exam. Once you start, they'll all go away and you'll calm down. But right, best of luck. Thank to you, all. Adam. Thank you very much. I think very well said. Uh, very good piece of advice. Thank you so much. Okay, continuing with our uh, charcha session, um, I've received a couple of questions uh, regarding year tens actually. So, are uh, are trial exams in year ten done on the syllabus covered or on the entire syllabus? Um, Okay, year 10 is only part of your GCSEs. So as I said in, the, in my introduction to what GCSEs are, it's a linear qualification. So only at the end of year 11, do you take the final uh, kind of exam. So which means that you're tested on what you've been taught in your year 10. So there is, uh, there is no set teaching order. So it's the, the teachers who decide, your school decides in which order the, the specification is taught. And um, uh, you will be questioned in your mock exams. When I say your mock exams, your school conducted mock exams based on what they have taught you that far, I mean, in, in year 10 so far. It's only towards the end of year 11 uh, or mid of year 11 when you are having your mock exams for your final GCSEs that you might be considering the entire specification being tested on that. There's also another question uh, regarding uh, CGP predicted papers from Amazon any good or um, are the past papers better? Um, would you like to pick that up, Mr. Abdul? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, yes, so past papers are the, the one of the places to first of all define past papers without having to go and buy the CGP stuff. Um, the past papers can be found on the exam board's website. They have previous past papers under the past papers and materials section, which also have the mark schemes to go with it as well. Um, and the CGP one, they're just an ex external third party publishers who make these really good revision guides and workbooks. And now they've started to do these um, predicted papers. Um, and they are good. They, they try to mimic the exam papers and they are useful for practicing at home. Uh, and so if you have done all the past papers from online that's available to you for free and you feel that, you know, the student can do a bit more, then I'll say yes. But I feel like there's already plenty out there on, on various websites online which are accessible for free, which are just as good or better, if anything. Um, what the CGP papers are just doing is that they're taking past paper questions from these different sources and putting it together themselves and then they're selling it on uh, for additional practice. So, yes, it's optional, but um, 
uh, like I said, the past papers from the examples available are just a, to, there's a plenty there to do already. Thank you. And just Thank to you. add to that, just before, so sometimes we, uh, uh, as Ms. Rao mentioned about the current GCSEs now being linear, the previous ones, uh, the what we refer to as legacy GCSEs or modular GCSEs, those papers are still useful for practice as well. It's just that the content has been just changed in terms of the order it's been taught in. And so it's slightly different. Um, there are some new things added to it and some things taken out. However, the majority, 90% of the stuff is the same. So if you've say done everything back to 2015, that's when the spec change happened, then I would advise you to try doing the older papers as well because they're still useful for exam practice. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, there is. They have another question from uh, Shoba asking uh, us to share some names of some exam providers. Uh, Dr. Sunil, do you have any um, suggestions or pointers towards that? Mock exam providers. I think you're on mute, sir. Um would be hard to point it out. I guess uh, the exam providers. I guess is the best uh, thing would be to keep your eyes open and then refer to a lot of options available on the uh, tutoring sites. And then there are advertisements which come up all the time. And at the same time, you could also refer to individual exam boards. But I think I don't have any much, much, uh, a lot to add upon this. Maybe the other speakers may comment a bit more on this. So is this to pick up, is this to, say, is this to suggest that they, the places where they can do a paper, uh, like uh, mock papers and externally yeah. to school, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, that's so, right. Yeah, so one popular one that uh, you know, there's, there's a branches of them, I think it's called Cherry Hill Tuition. They're also an exam center. So they they have optional, you pay to take up the, to, to take, for example, optional mock exams externally. Um, the other ones would be like things like Tutor Doctor or um, uh, there's a few others. I, I have to find the names and I can, I can share it. It's not a problem later. But yeah, generally the bigger centers who are, like tuition centers, but they're also an examination center. They offer external exams to be taken um, through them. Uh, also schools. So if somebody who's retaking their exams, schools are an examination center. So people can go back to their original school if they're retaking, for example. Uh, and so it might be something that you might want to um, if, uh, find out about. It depends when you want to do it. So if you're in year 10 and you want to do external exam, chances are your schools are going to already conduct exams that are going to be mock exams. But if you want to do additionally, I would say like something like Cherry Hill tuition, for example, that, that come, I've come across during my time that people tend to go used for additional exam, uh, mock exam setting. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, well, I have another well, question which had come up on um, in our registration. How do you prepare for the English subject GCSE exam? I uh, And I think even English literature, which I'm sure a lot of y'all would uh, would find it a bit overwhelming. <laughs> Amasai, would you like to pick that up? Sure. Um, I just wanted to add something to what Mr. Abdur said. So specifically for English language and literature, I would say that it's not uh, necessary for parents to go to uh, tutor centers. Um, what they would need to do is uh, the student themselves can go online and find a past paper or a mock paper. And uh, for example, one of the exams is two hours and, and 15 minutes long. And all the student would need is a parent to set an alarm and make sure that they are in you know, a quiet atmosphere at home without any distractions. And the student can sit that exam. As soon as the alarm is up, do not give them any extra time. And they can then take that paper. And I'm sure I'm not gonna be very popular with any local English teachers in saying this, but you, can, you have the right to go and give that paper to your English teacher or your English department and ask them to take a look. Maybe they will have time to mark it fully, maybe they won't, but they can definitely give your child some feedback. And that is within your rights as a parent. And your subject teacher will want to help your child to improve. It's within their best interest also. So before you go to any tutor centers as such, if it's only to sit an exam, an extra mock, you know, for practice, I would recommend that you do as much as you can at home for free and ask your subject teachers as well, um, you know, for any advice they may give you. Um, sorry, may you, could you repeat, Ms. Rao, the question currently? How do you prepare for the English GCSE exam, especially okay. English literature, maybe? Sure. Well, obviously, um, those who are about to take their GCSEs soonish, um, I'm hoping that they would already be prepared. But um, the main thing now with literature is that you do not take books in with you, which I know the students will be aware of. 
So you need to memorize your quote. So you will have, for English literature, you will have at least three texts, for example. So in our school, we, there's two plays. So we have Macbeth and Inspector Calls, and then there's a 19th century novella, which is Jekyll and Hyde. Those texts will be different depending on what exam board your child is, to, is taking for uh, English literature. So that's dependent upon the school, it's subjective. Um, and because they cannot take the text in, they need to memorize quite a few different quotes because they don't know, although they can use past papers and you know, mock exams to predict, it, it would either be on a character or a theme. So for AQA, for example, it's a character or a theme. But for other exam boards, such as the Dexcel, it might be um, you know, a more kind of form, for example, question, question geared towards form. So it really depends on you knowing your exam board, speaking to your teacher, knowing which texts you are going to actually be taking for English literature, which you should know by the beginning of year 10, and then actually using all the different resources that are available to you. So nowadays you're so lucky as students, you have YouTube, you have things on Spotify, you have, you know, all sorts of quote wraps and things that, to make it fun and entertaining. And you can actually be revising using those different methods. Um, I know that the student you spoke previously, uh, did, he said that he wasn't too fond of flashcards. Um, so use a method that you know will work for you. You know, you can use things such as, um, I'm trying to think now, uh, there is a, a really good, my mind. There is one, one, um, one app called Quizlet. Yes, so you can use you. Uh, you can use that as well, and then it can yeah. give you all different types of games in there to recall your learning and stuff like yeah. that. So there, yeah. there are multiple resources. I think kids know better than the teachers, to be honest. Yeah, there's yeah. Seneca as well for the basics. You know, I think some yeah. schools subscribe to that or not. So that's for literature, but for language, I think language. If you know your literature, you already have a good set, a good basics really. Again, English language is almost, the way we teach it at our school, certainly it's almost a science. There's a bit of a formulaic way that, to get into English language. And at GCSE, both subjects are important, literature and language. But if you excel in language, um, it's almost considered you know, better or higher, you know, well, more well-respected for your language grades. So on CVs, for example, and for universities, if you have scored maybe say a five literature, but you have a seven or above in language, they will be still look upon taking you into their, into, onto their course. And the same for career prospects. They will look at your English language and also your speaking and listening grade, which is separate. Great, thank you very much. Okay, I have a couple of um, uh, questions out here. One asking me, uh, is a student allowed to write the GCSE exam twice? once in year 10, another in year 11, and try to get better marks than year 10. Um, actually, uh, if I could answer that, I mean, I'm sure uh, the other guests can also add into this. First of all, the GCSEs need not necessarily be taken only in year 11. Um, they can be taken much, much earlier, provided the child is completely ready. But it's obviously advisable that the child takes it at a certain age, because they would have developed the confidence and the maturity to give an exam and take it up as seriously as possible. Uh, but anything that the school doesn't directly apply for you at the end of year 11, I think needs to be done privately. You can approach your school exams officer and ask them if you can take up the exam. However, it's going to be more of a private fee rather than the school doing it on behalf of you uh, automatically, which happens. And yes, you are allowed to, to retake an exam as many number of times as you wish. Uh, but as I said, it will be a private uh, retake rather than the school sponsoring that particular retake. Um, th there's another question. Um, Can I add a bit to the same point that you said? Yeah, I think there is another uh, thing where really, uh, probably if you are not happy with your grades and then there is a provision for you to appeal for your grades yeah. as well. So you can make a request and you can find that information on the government website as to how to appeal. You could make, but there's going to be a slight piece for it, but you apply for it and you wait for it and then hope for better marks. Maybe there is some mistakes here and there in the corrections or anything. So you can hope to get a better marks instead of uh, you know trying dead end of reappearing for the next year. Try your luck with appealing. Great. Um, I have another question here on the chat uh, saying how, ma how many days 
do you do it for for the exam like one day for maths and one day for geography and so on and i think there was another question regarding how do you manage time because you have multiple exams on the same day um, um so mr abda do you want to pick on that one please yeah sure so um first of all for generally these exams are spread over a month period so they tend to happen june may and was the end of May, maybe beginning of June. So they do, they do tend to be spread out. They don't, they try not to have two exams on the same day, but there are some exams where you can have two exams on the same day. And, and I think that preparing for those two exams on the same, same day is always a, a really ch a challenging thing to do. And I think it's always good to have um, a juggling method where you do a bit of both subjects. And, and I think one of the key thing I'd say with regards to revising for an exam or, or, or two exams on the same day would be uh, to ensure that you make like I know Adi earlier on mentioned about he doesn't he didn't really like flashcards, for example, but mind maps is a great way to kind of um, summarize the different topics. And he mentioned about blurting, for example, as a technique people love doing to see what, what they already know. Uh, and, and so, again, if there's two different exams happening on the same day, there is really no point in revising for your exam you know, at the end of the afternoon in the morning. So it's better to do the one in the morning for the morning time. And in using those tools that you would have prepared already in between your exam to recap some of those things using a mind map, for example, or other techniques. But generally, the exams are quite spread out anyway. So you shouldn't have more than one exam on the same day. But if it is, then you have to find a way that works for you. Uh, and usually, like I said, try different methods that will help you prepare for on the day to recap some of the notes beforehand. Um, and the what was the other question? Sorry, I think it was... Um, both the questions were pretty much the same. So they say that like one day for maths and one day for geography. How do you yeah. kind of space your revision cycles maybe? Yeah. How can uh, you manage that? Yeah. So I think in regards to the way the exams are spread out, I think um, it's really important that you you start with a, like I said earlier, run about a, a revision timetable. And I think knowing when your exams are very important. And so setting aside a time for each subject is crucial. So don't accommodate all the time to one subject. So um, try to, you know, the one way I do it is normally I say, do one hour of, let's say, subject A, followed by another hour of subject B, have a break, and then do subject C. And then, so then once you've done, this is obviously outside of school, by the way. So this is like saying in the afternoon. So then there is obviously <laughs> time you need to sleep and everything else. So it's important to accommodate, let's say, a uh, time that's relevant. So in year 11, at this stage, I would say you need to really push, you know, go put, put, put your foot down and really go for it. But yeah, so one hour, uh, also two hours a day would be really good. Uh, and then towards the end, when, you, when it comes to that close to the exams, um, I, I think you would just be, it'd be youth beneficial to just start with the exams that you have first to recap notes for and then follow it up as you go along because sometimes there's a gap between let's say paper one and a paper two so then you have plenty of time like a week or uh, maybe 10 days between some of them and so you have all the additional 10 days to do the additional revision for paper two now um so it's really important that you like i said have that plan in place in your revision timetable to accommodate equal time to all your subjects and not focusing on just one subject because what we find i can say for science is normally is um, especially if you're doing triple science sometimes people accommodate so much time to one of the sciences and not to the others and then you end up getting three very average grades um, and one very good grade and two other like a lower grade and so it's really important that you accommodate equal time to all your subjects and that's why I think the timetabling method really helps to accommodate equal time to all your subjects and then obviously in GCSEs you're having to juggle between 10 and 11 subjects so it makes it really really challenging and so this is where parents can I think support the students to help them devise a, a system that works best for that stu student and I would also say try different techniques and, and everyone's a different learner some are audio learners some are visual learners some are kinesthetic learners so some people learn by watching videos some people learn by you know listening to something like a podcast now that's a very popular uh, and then you know um as miss i mentioned earlier on like there's so many good resources on YouTube now since the lockdown. Lots of professionals, teachers, ex-students who have come up and made these really nice visual videos on things. Watch those in your own time. That really helps. Uh, and um, uh, and the last thing is like practice by doing. And I would say practicing lots of past papers is probably the fundamental thing to success when it comes to the exams itself. So, yeah, those are some of the things I would say coming closer to the exams that we should be doing. Yeah, if I would like to add what uh, Dr. has been saying, I mean, especially with respect to mathematics, because you have two separate types of questions, like um, the way to prepare for, uh, say, for example, non-calculator type of questions in mathematics is basically you give some importance to your mental mathematical skills. 
and uh, how well you could visualize things is very, very important. But when it comes to the actual exam duration, when you have some, say, for example, a week behind your exam, it's better to have around two or three cycles of your revisions or rather, say, of uh, preparations. In each cycle, you're going to start off with your overall overview of what you have studied so far. And say, for example, if you are color coded your questions, say, for example, green, blue and red, red are the ones which are difficult for you and blue are the ones so kind of you are pretty much confident of about answering, but you need to have another revision. But green is you're very confident of solving them up. So what I would suggest is that your focus on these red and the blue points in the beginning and then so that you become more on confidence. So you move around 50% of all your red questions towards the blue category by the time you have finished your first cycle. And the remaining 25% of the red category of your questions, you move them up to the blue category by the time you finish up your second cycle of revisions. And by the time you are done with the third, you are more than confident of answering your questions. So you should always have a strategy of how you could Look at and especially as already uh, always have been uh, everybody has been saying uh, there are many different ways in which you will be learning choose the one which is most preferable to you have a stress free environment make sure that you will use the time that you have and then do not be overwhelmed by what you have in front of you. That is one common mistake which I see all the places every student does. I am overwhelmed by so many things to do within a period of six days. Uh, do not be overwhelmed. Uh, have a strategy for the first two days, you finish up with 25%, next two days finish up with 25% and then start solving up until you've already solved question papers, you look at all the muddy, muddy points in your question papers and also exam papers, you prepare. That is the time when you prepare for confidence and not learning. You're not learning any new concepts in the exam period. You're only focusing all your efforts and building up your confidence. Absolutely. I think there's one more leading question to this. Are they giving formula and equation sheets in the exam? In my daughter's school, uh, they said they will give. So there are some, will... uh, yeah, there are some of them they do offer, but it depends on the school and the board, I guess. And, uh, and also, I guess, um, not all formulae need to be memorized in many cases. Uh, but I would rather say that uh, more than memorization, it should be another case of understanding. If you really understand a concept, you can make up a formula on this form. But uh, it reads some a lot of preparation from your end, whether it is formula or not formula. I would rather uh, put the onus not on the information being provided to help the students rather than the info. That I'll put the onus back on the student on their preparations and their background preparations because you really need to expect uh, at the GCSE level, let's expect um, slightly a bit more about ourselves uh, to know the formulas as to at least. And then what happens if you are given a formula and you don't recognize the form of the formula, right? So it's better to know about the formula and the expression that you are going to be using in your exams rather than relying on the exam board to provide the formula for you. So Thank you. If I can add to that as well, for science, from science to space perspective. So normally in physics, there's a lot of equations. So there's a lot of math involved in the physics, as you can imagine. So with the, the previous year, before pre-COVID times, the equation sheets weren't given in the exam. Maybe that's what they're referring to also. Um, so this year, last year, they were able to, they were given this equation sheet. And I believe this year in AQA, they are giving it also. So best thing to do would be to go to the exam board's website that your child is doing and just checking that they will be given the equation sheet because it does really help uh, with physics, especially because there are so many different equations. And I think to add to Dr. Sassuna's point is obviously you need to know how to use those equations. So you should learn them and practice them at home. But having them you know, on a sheet of paper, it just helps a little bit more just to know which one to use, maybe just to recall uh, more quickly in the exam time. So yeah, so definitely check the exam board, check that they are giving it. AQA are giving it for physics this year, for example um uh and they may not next year so this year's exam they will be providing it but again check if you're doing ocr or if you're doing edxl or um, any other example just double check that they are giving it or not adding on to what you said and also all the points that we have discussed so far and i think just like we have a mental map or a mind map of all the topics for preparation it is also helpful for example in, in physics for example and also in chemistry and maybe in mathematics as well to have a mind map of all the formulas right so uh um, the more you are in sync with your preparations, the better the mind map of the formulas and the equations become. Because many of the many of the cases, what happens in physics and chemistry? Well, consider physics, for example. If I give you a physics to MA, 
uh, then what is more important along with just the formula is and the using uh, capability of application is that the units that you are using. All right. So there are not just the formulas and uh, providing the units and the stuff like that. You really need to know certain background of information about, uh, you know, um, say be using a formula, for example, you will not be using only one single formula to arrive at an answer. You sometimes you will have to use a host of formulas or of a host of expressions which are connected up. So you have you 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 have two unknown variables in an equation. You have two unknown variables in another equation. You will have to know how to use them together. So there's no amount of uh, uh, help uh, on providing the equations or the formulas can help unless you know exactly how to prepare for it. So. Just like you have a mind map of the formulas and the expressions, the students should also develop in their course of preparations a mind map of their applications. Great, thank you. Okay, now I would like to uh, request uh, Shujana, Shujana Nayak to actually share her experiences uh, of the GCSE years. Hi, Shujana. Hi, namaste, my name is Shujana. I did GCSEs last year. And so for me, it was an interesting experience because I'd started them during the time COVID had just, we opened schools was opening, I was starting year 10. So for me, it was quite interesting because at first it was hard to get from the summer mindset to like starting GCSEs. So I found it tough at first, but as the months went on and I got used to my, like the work I was doing, I enjoyed it more. So it wasn't, it's not going to be as bad as it seems. It might be scary, but it really, as long as you put in the effort and you're comfortable with what you're doing, you'll be fine. So I chose my subjects in year nine. And the way I did it, I chose ones that I enjoyed, first of all, because you're going to be doing them for the next two years. So it's important to make sure that you do enjoy them because then you'll be more likely to revise for them when it comes to the time to revise. But I also chose ones that I knew I'd be able to do. I didn't choose like, I like astronomy, but I didn't choose the subject because I didn't think I was going to put the effort in and it wasn't practical for me to choose. So what I chose in the end was I took history, computer science, Spanish and art, art being like a subject for more of my passions. Um, so, yeah, when it came to year 10 at first, the one thing I would say to do is to definitely keep make sure your notes are done and filed safely so then you don't have to go back and redo your notes because it gets really hard to like go back and waste time trying to figure out what work you've done um I also made like simple flashcards on the way simple things for like biology especially where you need to know a lot of content just to make sure it was like in my brain for most of the time then um but yeah revision for me was different for each subject because each subject was just different in its own way so for example, history, I'd actually like speak timelines to my parents. I talk about what was going on in terms of in which country, what was going on, like what events were happening. And so that way it stayed in my brain as a story. And then I was able to like remember it easier for things like sciences, um, doing, oh, okay. And um, things like sciences, doing practice questions, um, learning content from summary sheets you can find online if you don't have your notes, for example. Putting things on flashcards, that was important. Maths, I would do practice questions like regularly. Um, so I took two or three topics a week, did practice questions on those. And then when it came closer to the exams and especially mocks, I would start doing papers because then what happens is the exam boards will give you similar questions each year but just with different numbers so if you have practiced questions before you'll be used to the style and so when you're in the exam hall and you're writing the papers you won't be as panicked because you'll recognize kind of like what you're meant to do for each question which is useful and it just lessens nerves at the time um and in terms of breaks what I do for me I was lucky I chose art so my breaks would be I would start doing my art coursework so I'd listen to music and just be doing art and that would be like my kind of break as well as doing like extracurricular activities then. Um, other things I would also do is having, having like a support system. So for things like English and stuff, I'm not as confident as English as I am maths, which I'm doing right now for A-levels. So I would ask my teachers like which kind of words to use. Um, I remember that in year 11, our teacher, I was lucky, our teacher really encouraged us to give us our own practice essays and that she would mark them and give us feedback. So definitely ask your teachers what to do because they will they will want to help you. Your parents, 
people around you, your friends, teachers, department heads, they will want to help you get the best grades possible. So definitely ask them for help whenever you need it. It's just important to do that. Um, other things I would say to do would be to like, what else? I think coming up to exams, definitely have everything ready, but don't revisit or redo notes because that is a waste of time. I, I can tell you right now, redoing notes is a waste of time. If you need backup notes, the internet will help you. Like there's a site called Physics and Math Tutor. They have a lot of questions on their Math Genie. Like if you search it up, you will find a lot of questions online. Um, I would just do those and yeah. I think one more important thing to me is that what I learned was even everyone's revision schedule is different and to not compare yourself to other people. I knew people who were doing so much revision, hours and hours every day because it worked for them and other people who did nothing. And I'd be like, what's wrong with me? Like, what do I need to do? Then I realized as long as I find the schedule that works for me and like the, and the, um, practices that I can do to make my exam like experience better is what is important it doesn't matter what other people are doing as long as you stay true to yourself and you're working hard and still maintaining like your mental health physical health you'll be fine um coming up to exam periods I would say definitely timetable your like schedule or like put block in your hours for which is which um I think I learned as you go on, if you block in the hours, then you're more likely to do them than if you just say you need to do this. If you're, I would checklist everything I needed to do for that day. And then when I ticked off, I would feel good because if I ticked off, I'd done an activity for a day. But yeah, um, remember that it's, these are important exams. So definitely work hard, but also just stay positive because if you put in the effort, you will get the grades you want and you should just maintain that cheerful attitude to your work. But yes, thank you. Great, amazing. Uh, very well said, Rajana. I think uh, spot on. I think you've said it so beautifully. I think it should definitely motivate all students taking up their GCSE exam. So before we wrap up today, I would like to actually uh, answer just one um, question for, um, I think uh, Sudha. Sudha has asked in India, answering a question would be points based. For example, four marks, six to eight points. How do students approach questions here for four to six markers? Uh, Ms. Sai, would you like to actually take that up and then we can all pull in for, uh, for science-based questions as well? Okay, that's such a really good question because um, you mentioned earlier English language. And for AQA, for example, English language is tested in two papers. So English language paper one and English language paper two. And um, there are different questions. So question one is the four marker in both papers. Question two, for example, would be an eight marker. And question three varies depending on whether it's paper one or paper two. Uh, by this time, the year 11 students will be quite familiar with uh, both papers. Um, and they should already know, you know, the different composition depending on the exam board. If they have, you know, uh, used online revision guides or they have revision guides, physical ones at home, those will also tell you which question and how many marks it has. But the biggest thing to help you for a four to six marker, I think, in my knowledge for English, is using models and using exemplars, ones that your teacher has given you, and knowing exactly how uh, your school is approaching. So in your English, your English teacher, for example, how do they teach you to approach that four to six marker question? English is quite a subjective subject. So you will even find within one school, within one department, if there are, for example, five different English teachers, they have a slightly different approach and each one has their own, you know, sort of skill base. So don't feel that you only have one English teacher to your, um, to go and ask, ask your head of English um, and, you know, get as much, enlist as much support as you can from your department. That's your right as a student, I would say again. So it really does depend on your exam board. Uh, for English language, particularly, I think having models and exemplars is very important as well. So um, your teacher should have already done this with you in school, uh, def definitely in year 10 and building up to year 11 as well. So you would should have actually already gone through the format in school, step by step for each question. They should have given you 
live modeling or done you know shared modeling with suggestions from the class and then taking them and actually showing you physically on the board or typing it or via teams so you should have a whole sort of pack of different examples for six marker questions 12 marker question and section b the second half of both english language paper one and english language paper two are quite important there are 40 marker question. So most of your English language GCSE is taken up with this second section. Now that 40 marker question, if you follow the exam paper and you'd actually take it in chronological order, you will actually be at your most tired. You will have already peaked by the time you go to the 40 marker question at the end. So I actually recommend to my students to go in fresh, maybe do question one, which is the four marker, and then go straight to your uh, section B, which is your 40 marker because it, it can actually become the deciding factor for your grade. So I hope that helps and I'm happy to take any other yeah, questions. Yeah, it does, it definitely does. I think I would just like to pitch in a little bit more about uh, sciences and uh, even computer science, where we do have uh, four to six markers. In fact, we have nine to 12 markers as well um, as we head to A-levels. And the, because they're more technical subjects, um, uh, it's, it's, it's very different in the way you're going to approach them. Uh, so as I say, there are there are three different types of questions in most of these science questions and uh, maths as well, which are the AO1, AO2, and AO3 type of questions. So your AO1 type of questions are more knowledge based. I mean, your definition, state, identify those kind of questions. They're easy marks. Your AO2 kind of questions is more understanding based. So you just need to probably apply a formula. You so you know your formula. You apply the formula. You get your answer. Simple stuff like that which are again, two marks, three marks kind of questions. So the longer kind of answers, they do expect an evaluation angle to it. And that's why they call us the AO3 uh, questions. Now it doesn't, it doesn't directly um, match up to saying six marks, six points. Rather they would kind of look at probably three different paragraphs, each point mentioned in a comparative style in every paragraph and where you would apply uh, the techniques that you learn in English, which is your peel technique, as they call it, your point, your evidence, your example, and then you link to it. But obviously with more technical um, uh, te technical stuff in it. And so the meat is it the technical bits in it. So uh, it totally depends on the kind of question. Um, so you have to demonstrate your knowledge, your understanding, as well as your power to evaluate, which is compare uh, to that kind of question and answer that to get maximum marks. I hope that answers. Mr. Abdu, do you want to um, jump into that one question too? Because I know sciences has a lot of it as well. Yeah, so I'll be quick with this one. So science is um, the, if they're one marker, two marker, three marker, or four marker, they tend to be a point per mark. So every point you make is a mark. If it's a six marker question, then they're, they're known as level of response question. So they're graded by level one, level two, and level three. So level one would be like one to two marks, level two would be three to four marks, level three would be five to six marks. They're also known as quality of written communication questions or QWC questions. So this is slightly different to the other questions. So the way they work is your answer has to be logical. It has to be answering the point to the question, relating it back to it every time. Uh, and also it's not marked per point here. So it's based on your response to that question. So based on how you've logically sequenced your answer and whether you've actually made your points clear and it's if, if it will lead to a, a, let's say a scientific outcome at the end. So if your answer is a bit illogical or it's a bit all over the place, and it doesn't really make fully sense you don't get a lot of marks on it so usually students don't do very well on those questions and that's what we try to give them model answers we try to give them uh, a support where how to you know scaffold their answer for example and so it's really important i would say for the six markers is just practicing lots of them under timed conditions because technically you, you um you should be spending just over a minute per mark and what happens sometimes with the six marker is they give a lot of space and then the students just go on and on and they kind of di digress from the question and ends up talking about completely something completely irrelevant. And so best way to do it is, and also to kind of um, add to that is, it does say it has to be written in full sentences. So it doesn't necessarily mean you can't write in bullet point form. It just means that you have to write in full sentences. Whereas in other questions, you can probably just answer with one word, for example. Um, but here you do, it does require you to write in full sentences. And they also take into account spelling and also punctuation and things like that, because it, that there's one additional mark for that normally. So you get five points for whatever logical answer you've made. And one additional mark is for logical and um, 
correctly spelled terms um, and just making sure that you actually need, reach your final outcome. So that's just that science angle on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think uh, yeah. I will hand over to Deepa. Deepa ji. I uh, just wanted to give one minute on oh, yeah, uh, the, sure, same, sure. the same Sorry. point from the perspective of mathematics. Yeah, sure. uh, you know, in mathematics, the way it happens is, okay, for example, you're going to get marks for methods and also for the numbers of the answers that you get, uh, right? Uh, you're going to have method marks and also get the accuracy marks, right? Uh, and accuracy marks is, depends on how well, how clear or how close you are in your numbers from your answers to the expected answer that is accuracy marks. And you will also have dependent marks. So for example, if you have a linked question, it's been a four marker, a four marker have a, where the answer to the second question depends on your answer on the first question. Then even though you might have got your first answer wrong, your second answer, you still deserve a chance of getting marks for the method that you are using. But however, you may lose on the accuracy because your number may run out. So you these working options out. are also available, yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Applies to, that also applies to just to say just to throw maths in um in science. So the numeracy in science, for some reason, when it comes to the element of maths in any science subjects, the students don't do very well on it. And usually it's because they don't show all their working. So what they do yeah. normally is they just do the calculations and their calculator and put the final answer down, and then That's they get the answer wrong, but then they've lost all the method marks. So I would advise all the students here to make sure you show all your working as you're going on, going through the question. And even if you make a mistake, you'll get error carried forward. So if you made a mistake in one part you might get the next marking point but if you don't show any of the working you get no marks so just always show your working absolutely and i think the same thing applies to computer science as part of sciences as well absolutely um great i think uh, we've had um, a fantastic discussion with all our guests thank you very much from my side as well i'm just going to hand over to deepa ji over to you uh, you did the session so very well. Uh, I thank everyone here for uh, uh, being here. And uh, I'm sure this was such a in, very useful session for everyone. I so very wish it, there was such session when my elder one was starting GCSE. But still, I feel this was more useful because I have one more child to go for GCSE. Uh, so as we come to the end of this today's uh, event, I would now request Mr. Manu Gauda to present the vote of thanks. Namaskara, namaste everyone. We have reached to the end of the webinar. The Kaho team believes that the event was helpful to all the DCSE students and the parents. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Sunil Anandatirtha Ms. Sadia Sahi and Mr. Ali Abda for kindly accepting our invitation. Your valuable time and presence helped, uh, helped to clarify the number of questions that our children and parents had. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'd like to thank our own Ms. Suprita Rao for accepting our request and being our event moderator. Your guidance help to put this event more structured and make it successful. Thank you, Suprita Ji. I'd like to thank all the children and the parents for joining the event. On behalf of Kaho, we wish you all the best for your exams. We encourage you to adapt the valuable inputs you received from the event while preparing for your exams. Those who are new to the Kaho, please join our WhatsApp group and follow us using the social media links shared in the slide. We wish you all the all be connected in one or the other way through the Kaho platform. Thanks to the entire Kaho admin team for your valuable time and support to put this event together and making it successful. Thank you, everyone. Dhaniwad. Wish you all a very nice evening and see you again and take care and bye bye. So by this, we will finish the event. Thank you. Thank you, Manu Gaudaji. Thank you. Enjoy. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Namaskara. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye.